We are speaking with the one and only Kasim Asaldum. The new album is Kasim 2021. See how I got that right? I'm, 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 I, I'm very proud of you, man. I'm a professional, I got to tell you. Yeah. But as we say here in Montreal, la bonjour et bienvenue. Hello and uh, welcome. Bonjour. Yeah, bonjour. It's it's a pleasure to be here. My French is horrible, even though I took it in school. <laughs> so I'm not even going to attempt to do anything but say hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So so before we get into to your really distinguished career, let's just quickly talk about this album and getting new music out. Because listen, we all know you could go out there and play Utopia's greatest hits or Bad Out of Hell, the 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 Kasim, Kasim uh, mm -hmm. tribute to Bad. You could do that, and people would buy tickets. So talk to me about the need to get new music out, because as a fan of music, I love when artists make new music. I, I do not like artists that sit on their hands and say, hey, I did it 20 years ago. I'm done. Just, you know, buy my greatest hits. You know, it's um, it, it, it really is depends on on the particular person and, and what motivates you and what drives you. Some people feel that, you know, I did that. And now it's time to garden. Or, you know, it's time to like, you know, do work around the house or um, any one of a number of things, buy a, a, a car, a sports car and work on it. Um, from, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I, I need to be constantly creating new music, whether or not I, I, I chose to put it out or, or if it's just for me. Um, it, you know, that's kind of besides the fact, but I firmly believe that I was put on this planet to create music. And that's what makes me that that's my happy place. It so. really is. When you get to this point in your career and you're creating new music, what sort of inspires you in the sense that do you look back to the body of work and say, man, set me free was so great. Let me write another 10 like this. Or do you say, yeah, been there, done that. Let me push the boundaries and see where, where I can go. At any time that, that you sit down and, and try to capture lightning again it, it usually fails more often than not you know um and that and 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 to me that kind of that forced creativity is uh is a mistake um it's not good to uh to 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 try to force yourself to do something because you think that that's going to be successful so nine times out of ten the best thing to do is just let it happen and you know it doesn't always work out uh the way that you plan it to um but you remain true to your to yourself and to your art and to the muse that that makes you create absolutely um I do want to quickly uh, touch upon uh, Utopia for a second, and I'm going to start with this. Uh, Todd Rundgren, who of course is going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, produced, I guess, every one of your albums, right? I'm, I'm, unless I'm mistaken, or most no, of he, them. Todd, Todd did not produce any. Oh, you mean U Utopia album? Yeah, 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 Utopia. Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Todd produced every Utopia album. We the the band kind of co-produced, but for the most part, you know, we we kind of. Uh, tipped a hat to Todd and to his uh, production credits and the fact that he's done so many records and and there were, you know, so many successful records yeah. that, uh, yeah, Todd produced all the Utopia albums. And that's what, I mean, he, he did uh, Cheap Tricks, Next Position, Please, which I think is just a brilliant album. But, but let me talk to you about that because when you're making your own music and you have a member of the band in there, is it not sort of dangerous to not have a set of outside ears, have outside ideas, you, you know, and I'm thinking of the of a Bob Rock or a, or a Bob Ezrin or, or a Ron Nevison to say, hey, that's yeah. great, because can it get too self-indulgent? Well, yes, it can. And, <laughs> uh, and, and occasionally it does. Um, I think that uh, in, in, in our particular case, we were all... Um, we were all well versed enough in uh, in making records, and mind you, when I joined the band, I had never made a record before. That was the, the first time I had ever recorded uh, uh, a record that was released nationally. Um, so after uh, after the first two or three records, then you're you, you know you're kind of like oh, okay, well we did that, and we know how that's going to turn out, and let's maybe we should try this, and maybe we should. 
you know, try that. So we all had a hand in it, but I think that to, that you, you know, to overall supervise the overall supervisor of the record um, was always Todd. And you are correct; it it, it sometimes is difficult to remain um, uh, objective right. when <laughs> when it comes to your own material. Uh, but I think, for the most part, that we did a pretty good job of uh, of of not being too self-indulgent. Um, uh, you know, we might have gotten, let it got away with it, with us um, uh, here and there. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, those are good records. Those are really, really good pop records. And um, True. Yeah. And so we did something right. You, you did. And uh, I, I also now want to get to the, the Canadian perspective, because we're talking about Casim 2021. You had Casim mm -hmm. in 1982. Right. Yes, I did. And Don't Break My Heart, the single, mm -hmm. charted in Canada. In fact, it was a top 40 hit in Canada. Talk to me about that. And, and how does one have a hit just in Canada, but not in the States or not? Like, what was it about our market where they just went, yeah, we like this guy. This is a good song. You know, again, I have no idea. And the fact that I didn't capitalize on that um, at the time was uh, what it was just criminal. Um, but uh, that was at that at that particular time that that song spoke to some radio guy up in, in Canada. And uh, and yeah, I had a top 40 hit on my uh, on my solo record. The problem was. The problem was, was that I started the record with Roy Baker. Roy Thomas Baker. Roy Thomas was the, Baker. Yeah. Uh, Roy from, uh, who produced all Queen. the art records and Queen. Right. Um, and in uh, and, and, and about six weeks into working with Roy, uh, the project just fell apart. Um, Roy and I didn't see eye to eye on a, on a number of levels. And, uh, and Roy dropped out. Right. And uh, and I had already spent um, about one hundred thousand uh, dollars in, <laughs> in terms of Roy's B and the studio and musicians and incidental stuff here and there. Uh, the record company, thank goodness, uh, Gary Gersh and EMI said, it's OK, we'll find another, you know, we'll find another producer. I found another producer, Bruce Fairburn, Canadian. Yes. The lovely and Bruce Fair God rest his soul, by the way. Because God rest his soul. One of the most brilliant guys I have ever worked with. Just a sweetheart, really nice guy. Took a bus from the <laughs> Staten Island Ferry to my house on Staten Island to work on on tunes for the for the new record because we had to start from scratch. We wow. couldn't use and I'll just, just by the way, I'm just going to throw this in as a Canadian, but that whole scene of Little Mountain, Bob Rock, Jim Valens, Bruce, yeah. yes. I mean, just wow. And they created yeah. such a drum sound and they created so, that, that whole the, All that those whole, hits, all the, that music that, that wound up being soundtrack uh, to so many lives. Aerosmith, Bon Joe, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, 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 they, yeah. they gave me the 80s. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I got to work with Bruce before Bruce. Bruce became very, very famous. Right. So, um, so in any case, I, I wound up. I went back into the studio, spent another hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a record, <laughs> and uh, so now we're at two fifty. And um, <laughs> and record companies like, well, you know, this record is like it, it, it costs us a pretty a, almost three hundred thousand dollars to produce in nineteen eighty one money. Um, it's like so one point two million at this point. Right. So we don't have to do any promotion on it. It's going to speak for itself, you know, uh, and that's part of the reason why I did not capitalize on uh, on a, a, a hit in uh, a top 40 hit in Canada, in Canada was because there was just no more money left. Wow. What that, yeah. Boy, boy I, I got to say, and, and that's when you learned the word recoupment, I'm sure. Yes. Well, I still have not recouped. As, as a matter, yeah. But that's a, that's another story. <laughs> that's, a, that's another story for for another yeah. day. Um, I, I'm going to jump around here because there, your sure. your career is so incredibly diverse. And uh, but the new cars, because you mentioned the cars yeah. with Roy Thomas Baker, and you went uh -huh. out there, and I have the album. I I think the album's great. Yeah. That, that it's new a good cars. Album. It, it, 
Yeah, it's, a, it's like an EP too. Is it an EP or was there a whole album? Oh, it's, it's part, half live, half. Yeah, something like that. But yeah, but there was a an, and and the tour yeah. was the tour was fun. I mean, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but but they had you singing "Drive." If if my mm -hmm. memory is not uh, failing. Yeah. Um. Talk to me about that because that's a very difficult spot. Because when the fans are sitting there, they have a memory. They have a favorite guy. Mm -hmm. He passed away. So w was that difficult for you to convey that? Was it fun for you? Was it a was it a tribute, or were you like, oh boy, maybe we should just skip this one? Um, you know, going into that project. Um was was pretty interesting it was um uh, put together by alan kovac yeah was, big uh, manager uh, yeah. crew. uh-huh and meatloaf uh yeah. blondie um and uh so alan was very very famous at that time for mm -hmm. um for kind of reviving careers mm -hmm. that were kind of languishing a little bit right. and uh and thought that you know here's a perfect opportunity to uh, take a music that that was, you know, just ridiculously popular, um, and uh, and and bring it back in a live uh, a live setting. Um, when when it came time to delegate, you know, you sing this, Todd singing this, I'm singing this. Uh, uh, um, I specifically wanted to sing Drive because um, that was just a special song to me. It was just a real really really great track um i knew ben tangentially we had said hi to each other a number of times over the years the cars on more than one occasion opened for utopia before wow. they before they were a big act um and uh along with cheap trick too um and and, uh, and so I knew Ben and uh, Elliot Easton uh, had played on my so on my first uh, solo record. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I knew Greg um, and David, not really, I didn't really know Rick, but in any case, um, I just really liked the song. And I thought that I could do justice to it because I kind of sing a little bit here and there. And uh um, and, and I was really happy that I got to sing that song. I still do that song to this day in my solo shows when I play, when I do solo acoustics sh uh, shows around the areas uh, that I play. Um, I play uh, Drive on just myself and an acoustic guitar. It's a great song. Oh, wow. H have you uh, uploaded that to YouTube or made it available? Because yeah. I, I would check that out in a minute. There are uh, there are versions of it on YouTube. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 I'd have to look. I, I, or you can look. I'm yeah, sure I'll look. That, type uh, in Cassie Salt and Drive. Is that something uh, as a project that might interest you moving forward is putting out a solo album where you cover a song like Drive and then go back and maybe rework a couple of Utopia tracks and go back to the Kasim album or Cat Kasim, sorry, album okay. and, and, and rework some of that stuff, it, you know, give it a 2022 version kind of thing that might be an idea i mean <clears throat> currently i'm just uh, i'm just concentrating on this record which was was yeah. a, a departure uh in many ways for me I, I i i don't think that had i left been left to my own devices i would have made a record like this um it was only because i worked with uh phil thorn alley um as a producer uh phil produced the, the entire record that um that i i wound up with the record that was released um right. i i i think i uh, it, it would be markedly different if i had done it uh, all by myself which i used uh, i'm used to doing everything right. by myself working with a producer it's it's more um there's a little bit uh, more of a sense of urgency because you, you have you're with someone in the studio and they're like and, and you say, I can, I can do that much better. And they're like, no, it's fine. Let's right. move on. Let's right. just, let, we, we've got that. Let's go. Okay. You know, um, I might still be working on the record if I was <laughs> by myself. Um, so, uh, so yeah. And, and, and it's just nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of and not to just, you right. know. And that's I, what I meant before about being too self-indulgent when you're producing yourself is that you just, you get caught up in it. I can do better. I can be perfect. Yeah. I can, whereas... Every so often, you just need a producer to go. No, you caught the vibe. Just exactly, get perfect and, and vibe. One of the one of the most brilliant um, 
comments that I've ever gotten. I've, I've done a lot of work with Jim Steinman, another person, God rest his soul. Yep. Um, and Jim said one of the one of the most poignant things he had, had ever said to me was, you know, Cassim, um, I, I, I remember asking him, you know, do we do you want me to play it like this or do you want me to play it like that? It's like I really can't tell you. He said, he said the the, the whole thing about making a decision is the death of all possibilities. <laughs> true, that's true. So, so, in fact, let me ask you about that on this new album and albums in general. What are you more concerned with, catching a vibe and, and having sort of that perfection in the imperfection? Or are you more like, I need the auto-tune, I need the Pro Tools, it's got to be perfect, it's got to be linear, it's got to be... Uh, I, I, I absolutely hate auto-tune, and I, I, I right. will, uh, you know, go out of my way to, to tell producers, do not put auto-tune on my vocal. Right. Um, now, it, can it be used as an effect uh, sure. occasionally? absolutely for sure but um but I, I i think it just takes a human element out of you know uh, there's something about in, imperfection that that is perfect right you, you know what i mean yeah absolutely yeah. listen go back to the early black sabbath or or, or any and they're they're, they're you know or, or rolling stones with charlie watt he'll start at, at, at a certain beat and by the end of the song he's like five times faster and you go yeah oh my god yeah. absolutely and, and now a producer would run that through a machine and say, don't worry, we'll, we'll correct. And it's just like, no, that's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, you know, it's, uh, there are certain um, advantages that we have working with computers and computer, you know, making music with computers yes. that we never had before, but there are also, it takes, uh, you know, it does take some of the human element out of it. And, uh, and, and, and for me, the kind of music that I do depends on uh, imperfection. So, you know, it's I'd rather it be imperfect. Yeah, you you need to keep that human element. And yes, you know, cutting tape with a razor blade and horrible. Thank God for, for Pro Tools and flying yeah. sections. And but, man, if you take those early Sabbath or Stones things and you start correcting them, pitch correcting them, mm -hmm. and they would just you, sound like cardboard. They would sound horrible. I guarantee it. We we both know that they would not have the same impact that they do now even led zeppelin records yes. or you and know any or, band from the 60s or band, seven. Any elvis Rolling anybody Stones, beatles anybody you name it you know you start correcting those things and um and all of a sudden the the the, the life is just sucked right out the whole it. swagger is gone yeah. it's gone yeah yeah um speaking of old bands and bands from the 60s uh, the beatles you did an album called deface the music which mm -hmm. sort of played on Beatles songs. Uh, talk to me about that concept, because it's, you know, when you listen to it, you can hear the influence, but you're not you're not doing a covers album by any means. Um, it's a interesting yet strange album at the same time. So it's like it's 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 like a masterpiece, <laughs> right? Well, thanks. Um, that that's that's an interesting way to put it. Um, and the funny thing about that record is we had done a record prior to that mm -hmm. one Utopia, uh it was called adventures in utopia oh, yeah. um and that record had a, a hit on it a top 20 hit um actually uh, uh or top 30 or something like that uh set me free right uh, it was a big record for the band um we were uh we had sold almost a half a million copies of that record for utopia that was unheard of Right. Um, so both uh, uh, myself and uh, Roger and, and Willie, the keyboard player and drummer in Utopia, was like, "This is great. We are gonna. We are. We are poised for greatness here. All we have to do is make another record like this, and we'll be over the top." Right. And uh, and I remember distinctly getting to the studio for the start of of the next Utopia record and Todd saying I've already recorded four songs for the record and we're like great Rick what are we doing we're doing a Beatles record what do you mean we're doing a Beatles well what we're doing is what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all all our favorite Beatles songs and rewrite them and we're like what um <laughs> and he's like yeah it'll be great don't want, you know we're, and we're gonna record it like live too we're not gonna do hardly any overdubs and and myself and and the two other guys were like, is this really a good idea? Is this what we should be doing? Didn't matter. 
Todd was, you know, hell bent on doing this kind of a record. And, um, and, and unfortunately, uh, right at what, right when the record was released, uh, John Lennon was, or Shot. just prior yeah, he was assassinated. So the last thing that anyone wanted to hear was a Beatle parody record. Um, but it was a good record and there were all good songs on it. And we did have a good time making the record. And do, do I regret making that record? Absolutely not. Right. And, and I love Todd for, for the fact that he was, he, he specifically said, we are not going to make the same record twice. We're just not going to do that. That's not what we do. I did want to quickly ask you about the the context at the time because Double Fantasy comes out. Uh, this album comes out like in early fall, and then in the winter, uh, John gets shot. Was was that sort of strange and disappointing in the sense that here you you've you've paid tribute to somebody that you love because you've been in a in a Beatles tribute band. Yeah, and and then I mean it 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 just must have been completely bizarre in your own head at the time just going wow double fantasies out we got he's got singles on the radio we're gonna have our album and it, it just ends before yeah. christmas um actually on my birthday um, Oh wow! It, yeah and i was about three blocks away um Oof. i'm having dinner with roy thomas baker um wow. yeah and uh um it was it was Oof. devastating. By the way, that, that gave me chills. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. Um, it was an absolutely devastating event and um, completely just so unnecessary. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, um, I, I don't know that I put two and two together at the time and right. said, you know, this is the, you know, this is the worst thing that could happen for, uh, for a record that we're about to release. I think that uh, yeah, not, and I'm not insinuating that there was any. No, kind no, no, of... no, no, no. I, yeah. I know that. I know that. But I, I even think that that just uh, just to this day, um, you know, the, the 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 impact of losing somebody like that, um, who was just such a, uh, a, a, a an amazing um, person who did really, really good things with his celebrity. He really, really did. He wasn't the kind of celebrity, he wasn't a Kardashian. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, it wasn't like, he wasn't famous for doing nothing. He was famous for doing something. And, uh, and, and his, his whole take on, you know, I grew up, I grew up, I was a Paul McCartney fan when I was a kid. I wanted to be Paul. I wanted to be Paul McCartney. And it wasn't until uh, I, I I was in my in, in my 30s and 40s that I was like you know you know who's the real guy in that band it's John that he was he was the guy he was the real guy and uh, unfortunately um, I never I never met George but I have met and and said hi to all three uh, the Ringo I've worked with Ringo I had a wow. nice conversation with Paul uh, a couple of times and I met John on 72nd Street while he was window shopping with Yoko uh, when I was <laughs> 17 years old wow. Wow. wow that's kind of exciting so so then to quickly talk to about that in, in terms of the Beatles influence are you one of these that have that story I saw them on Ed Sullivan and said I want to do that and here we are in 2021 going that's exact that's exactly that's what the happened. story I I, I uh, you know, my dad brought um, uh, the single home uh, two weeks before, and I remember sitting in my kitchen on on the kitchen floor with the Victrola and putting the single on that uh, on the uh, on the uh, record player, and like th these guys were aliens. I, I don't know where they come from. They're not from this planet. And then two weeks later, they're on Ed Sullivan, and when I saw them on Ed Sullivan, I said. That's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so, so let me ask you, since your dad brought the single home, he obviously liked music. Did he encourage you and say, here's a bass or here's a guitar, or, here's a drum, go for it? Or did he say, listen, stop being a silly kid, get over to the factory, learn how to put in rivets, and off you go? I mean, that was my mom. That was your mom. <laughs> my, mom said, my dad was like, if this is what you want to do in life, you tell everybody to go to, to, go to go take a flying leap because right. this is what you should be doing. That's amazing because, you know, most musicians that I talk to, it is a parent 
that was encouraging that said, yeah. go be you and we'll yeah. figure it out. Um, yeah, that was my dad. Yeah, so, he was good. He, he was good for that. So how important was that? And also, you know, as you get into Utopia and you do this other stuff, was he there? Was he involved in the business? Was, you know, did he, did he forward money? Did how, like how, how far did the support go? I mean, was he one of these guys with a backstage pass at every gig going, that's my son. We played Radio City Music Hall. Right. Uh, we did two nights at Radio City Music Hall, Utopia, right. uh, by ourselves. There was no opener. We played by ourselves at Radio City Music Hall. My dad came, I think, the first night and fell asleep in the audience. <laughs> he was he was he was asleep in you know in his seat because he had worked the whole day. He didn't he didn't See, care. It, about it wasn't a review. It was just that he worked all day. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, exactly. But he uh, he didn't care about the, the celebrity. He didn't really? care that his son was, you know, successful or uh, or making records or, you know, traveling around the world. He cared that his son was doing what his son loves to do and that he helped. Wow. That's all I added to him. And, and and here you are in 2021 still doing it. I mean, it's like an ode yeah. to your father every time you step on that stage. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's... Uh, yeah, I miss him. You know, he's been gone for about 24 years now i think um but he was he was a special guy and uh yeah um i uh yeah if, if he hadn't encouraged me it might have been a, a, a much different journey for me. much different journey well in fact here um since we since you mentioned journey i i interviewed steve perry in 2004 big fan big fan and, and i said to steve i said steve why aren't you out there touring why aren't you singing songs and making albums i mean why are you sort of retired you know this is 2004 and he looked at me and he said mitch my mom and my dad have passed away i have no reason to get on stage because i know they will never hear me again oh that's it, yeah it, it was yeah. just like wow yeah that's... But yeah, that's I mean, but, you know, uh, for me, I I can understand what he says. My mom's 91. Wow. And My dad, too, by the way. That, that's great. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and she uh, she's drinking the Kool-Aid. She loves that. The fans love her and she loves coming to see me. <laughs> that's great. Um, but uh, but even if she if if and when, of course, uh, she she goes, um I don't know that I would stop because a parent, uh, you know, it's like I do what I do for me, uh, but also because I bring some joy to a few people. And that's what's most important to me. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and before we we wrap up, uh, just quickly, uh, working with Meatloaf and, mm -hmm. and the success that had, I mean, how unexpected was that or or did you just listen to the album and that, that you played on and just went yeah that th this is this is this is the real deal here <laughs> no i thought the opposite yeah. actually um uh we uh we did that record uh, uh re we rehearsed the record for two weeks uh there was four people in the room it was my well i mean besides jim and me uh there was myself Todd on guitar, Max Weinberg on drums, yeah. and Roy on keyboards. And we recorded that record in two weeks, um, the wow. basic for, for Bad Out of Hell. Um, when I finished my part, after I did some, I did some background vocals on the record as well. When I, when I was done, I was convinced I would never hear that record again. I will never hear this music again. I did it. It was good. It had a good time. I, I got to work with Roy Bitten, who was a, a amazing keyboard player um and then about a year and a half later um i was driving in my car up to woodstock to start a utopia tour a utopia record or something like that and i'm listening to the radio and, and i heard something vaguely familiar uh, uh on wnew fm in new york and i'm like where where have i heard that song before um <laughs> Oh, right. That's the record that I did a year and a half ago with Todd and, and Roy Bitten. Um, that's great. That's all oh, those guys got their, their song on the radio. How cool is that? <laughs> 52 million, 46 million records later. later. It's one, still one of the biggest records of all time. What's amazing about it is that pretty much all of Utopia played on it. 
I'm just looking yeah. at you. Todd's on there. You're on there. Uh, Willie's mm-hmm. on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Roger <laughs> plays on um, one song, I think. Yeah, so so you've got the. Uh, let's see, Roger Powell. It says he's played on four songs, apparently, according to. Oh, okay. But oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I played bass on that whole record, and so I'm very very proud of that record. Yeah, it's it's no, listen, it's a, it's it's an interesting record, and and like like I like you, when you hear it the first time, you go, "There's no way this is going to be big," and then of course you hear right. Dashboard Light and two out of yeah. two, and you go, "You go, yeah, all right, I got it." Yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, and then I'll, I'll I'll wrap up on this for for Utopia. How do you sort of sum up the career? I mean, in 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 one hand, you know, you didn't get to that level of Metallica or U two or Madonna or whatever. But on another level, plenty of records, uh, great uh, fan following, great, I don't want to say cult following because that sounds sort of diminutive, but, you know, people know the name, people respect the name. You've gone on to do, do great stuff. Todd's gone on to do great stuff. So how do you how do you sort of sum up Utopia? I'll tell you, um, yeah, we weren't hugely successful as a uh, as as a, like mass appeal or anything right. like that. But, but you're not a failure of... by any any stretch no, of the no, imagination. No, I mean, no, no, know, no, no, no. Great, ba- but, great band. But here's the thing about Utopia, and right. the thing that that I hang my hat on. Um, I went to see uh, um, Ringo, uh, mm-hmm. the All Star Band, uh, and I took my kid with me. My, so I took my son. And uh, we went to um, uh, some venue in Pennsylvania because they were close by New York. And I wanted to say hi to Mark Rivera, who's Ringo's saxophone player, and uh, Greg Bissonette, the, the second yeah, drummer. The, the drum, uh, drummer. And, and Lukather, Steve Lukather, who was playing guitar at the time. So uh, um, I got there for the sound check. I was hanging out on stage and uh, I had my son with me on stage and Steve... Um, came uh came up and i introduced him to my son and steve said to my son he said he said your dad your dad's a, a kick-ass bass player and so the point that i'm trying to make is um is that utopia was a band that other musicians really enjoyed listening to yeah. and if i had a nickel for every time a peer of mine someone who i grew up listening to said you play in Utopia. That's a great band. That was a great band. Richie Sambora, Jason Faulkner, um, Cy Kernan. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I, if I if I went through my phone and looked at at the the names in my phone, Rick Nielsen, uh, Robin Zander, Tom Peterson, um, Daryl, and John, and yeah. uh, you know all these people who were like Utopia. That was a musicians band. That was a great musicians band, and and that's what means the most to me about that band that my peers yeah i'm just gonna say are you happy that you're a musician's band and that you didn't chase singles and you didn't you didn't be contrived and just say we're gonna be a top 10 band and we're we're gonna go right you know we're gonna get vinnie ponce and we're or desmond child and we're gonna go right i was made for loving you and be be it (laughs) listen would i like to be dry you know would i like to have to choose between the the tesla x or the ferrari (laughs) yeah i would like that but i don't so so what i have to choose from is um it, it, it is the ex, it, 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 the the um acknowledgement of my uh, of my musicianship by my peers which is in the big picture more important yeah it kind of is and uh, yeah. you did mention richie sambor you played with richie for a while yeah you? i did yeah yeah i was in one of richie's solo bands and just talk to me about that experience real quick, because I think, much like Steve Lukather, he is one of the most underrated guitarists. Underrated because... guitar players, just a brilliant guy. And I, I, I had such a good time working with Richie. I had such a, a, an amazing time. And I've worked with John, too. But I've oh, also, wow. I, 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 had, I had such a great time working with Richie that I sat down after a tour and wrote his mom a letter <laughs> <laughs> telling her what a wonderful son she raised wow that's yeah good. What, what did you do with john i i i'm not uh, i played a couple of gigs with john uh we did a, a british music awards together i, oh, okay. I played in the band for a, a heartbeat because alec uh wasn't at the at a show and i did a fan party with john and we've been friends uh, for, oh, wow. uh you, wait you actually played in bon jovi because alec wasn't there yeah uh we did the brit a brit awards show 
How did I miss that? I'm a huge Bon Jovi fan. Well, hey. 1995, it was myself uh, and Brian May was in the band too. Oh, wow. And I guess, yeah. uh, I guess Yui McDonald wasn't available that night because... Yui was not doing the live shows. Alec was still doing all the live all shows. All the live shows. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And look who they called. They go, we'll get the guy from Utopia. Well, I just happened to be on the Concord with them. Uh, and <laughs> at, they were going to get somebody in England. And John said, are you going to... Because I was at the Brit Awards with Meatloaf. Right. So... Um, so he said, if you can, he said, do you think you could perhaps you could play the song with us? Uh, uh, cause we have like one song to do on the show. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll be there anyway. Oh, what, should, what, what song did you do? 95. So that's gotta be like these days or something for the pain or. No, um, um, uh, sleep when I'm dead. Oh, there you go. That's a perfect yeah. song. Yeah. Oh, that's, I'm going to go look. That's gotta be on YouTube. Well, look it up. It's gotta be somewhere. It's got, and you you haven't done any of the John Solo stuff, have you? The uh, no, Destination. I, I would, huh? uh, no, I would love to work with John again, but um, no, it has. Uh, Yui's got that gig all lined up. So Yui he's, he's... is the nicest person you'll ever meet, and I know. also a monster player. I mean, he just well, you know, Yui played on all the records. Yeah, he did. Yeah, everything. He's, yeah. He, he's on from record one. That's <laughs> Yui. Yeah. Yeah, and and I know that for two reasons. One, because Alda Nova lives down the street from me. And so we've had this conversation. I know Aldo. Yeah. Aldo, Aldo's great. He, he literally lives 10 minutes from me. I, I've been to uh -huh. his house a bunch of times. Um, and um, Richie Sambora told me in an interview, I said, so, you know, let's be honest. Why, uh, why, uh, why didn't Alec play on the records? And he said, listen, we were moving too fast and Alex was moving too slow. Alec was moving too slow. Yeah. Hey, That's whatever. okay. It's all right. Yeah. But Utopia, no ghost musicians. No ghost musicians, never, but never. Have you done the ghost musician thing? Because Steve Lukather is like on twenty five hundred <laughs> records. Um, I, you know, there are a couple records out there that have, that have my performance on it that I either don't remember or not credited for, but that's okay. C'est la vie. Right. Yeah, c'est la vie. Uh, Casima twenty twenty one available now. Fantastic record, just a fun, fun listen. I, I encourage everybody to go check that out and. Uh, as we say in Montreal, merci. This is an absolute pleasure. Merci. Merci. It was my pleasure, Mitch. I really, really enjoyed this talk. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. And I, I know we sort of jumped around neurotically, but I mean, listen, you, you've been around for 50 years. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> and no, no, we had a great time. <laughs> thank you, sir. And uh, anytime, let's do, uh, anytime you have anything, just let's tell Chip or tell whoever and let's set another one up because you got more it. than happy to. And I've thank got you so many more layers of the onion to peel so yes absolutely yeah we'll do it again merci cheers okay bye-bye cheers all right